Hi, welcome to your 9.1 to 9.4 quiz review video. You will be taking a quiz tomorrow on these topics. So this video is gonna be a bit longer than usual because I do need to go through one of each type of question that you're gonna see on the quiz. Um, also note here, the numbers are gonna be kind of random. What I did is I just took problems off our 9.1 to 9.4 quiz review. And these were the problems that we were gonna go together, go through together in class, but obviously now class is online, so here we are, right? So they're gonna kind of jump around, sort of weird. Don't mind that, just pay attention to the content, and then you're gonna have one of each type of these problems to practice on your quiz review homework. So here we go. The first problem, we wanna solve the quadratic equation by graphing the related function. We're gonna label the vertex and axis of symmetry and list our solutions. So the first step here, since I have a quadratic, I always want to start by finding the vertex when I'm making a graph. Remember, the formula for the vertex is x equals the opposite of b divided by 2a. You can find this information in Lesson 9.1 in your notes booklet. Okay, remember the a, b, and c are just the numbers in front of the variables. So here our a is 1 and our b is negative 2. If we do the opposite of b... So the opposite of negative 2 is now a positive 2 over 2 times a. a is 1. Simplify that. 2 divided by 2, which is 1. So x equal 1 is the axis of symmetry. We find that first. That's the middle of our graph. Remember, that is also the x-coordinate of our vertex. To find the y-coordinate of our vertex, we can use our graphing calculator. So I'm going to make a table. And remember, when you make your table, the vertex and axis of symmetry needs to be the middle of your table. Okay, then we can just go ahead and type the equation y equals x squared minus 2x minus 3 into our graphing calculator. Then hit the second button and then graph, and that's going to bring us to a table. Scroll around in your table until you find 1, and I can see from my table that the value at 1 is negative 4. Then we need to choose two points before that and two points after. So I'm going to use 2 and 3 going backwards, 0 and negative 1. And then again, I'm just copying these numbers out of the table on my calculator. You could plug in the x values by hand as well if you'd like. Okay, notice how my table is symmetrical. The vertex in the middle, and then these two are the same, and these two are the same. All right, so now we're ready to go ahead and graph our parabola. I'm going to start by making my vertex. Vertex is at 1, negative 4. So right here. And then the axis of symmetry you can draw as a dotted line. That's the middle of your graph. All right, then I'm going to plot my other points here in green. Negative 1, 0, 0, negative 3, 2, negative 3, and 3, 0. Then make a smooth curve. We know it's going to be that parabola, U-shaped graph, like so. And now for the solutions, we do have the vertex. Let me fill the rest of that in. It's at 1, negative 4. The solutions, remember, are the two spots, or sometimes there's one, sometimes there's none, where our parabola crosses the x-axis. It's the x-intercepts of the graph. So you can see that for my first one, it's crossing at x equals negative 1, and the second one is crossing at x equals 3. You can also see in my table how those two numbers are both where the y is equal to zero. Now let's solve a quadratic using a table. Okay, to use the table, the first thing you need to do is you need to type this equation into the y equal in your graphing calculator. So I went ahead and typed the equation into the y equal in my graphing calculator. Remember your y equal button is right there. So type the equation exactly how it looks. And then to get to the table, you're gonna wanna hit the second button and then the table. And if we hit that again, the second button, and then the graph button, it brings us to our table. Now for our table, we are looking for the values where y is equal to zero. But you can see in my table, y is never equal to zero. So remember when y is not equal to zero in the table, when you scroll around, you can't find where it's equal to zero, you wanna look for where does the sign change? Okay, so I can see right here between negative three and positive three, my sign changes. So when x is negative 2, we're at negative 3. When x is equal to negative 1, I'm at a positive 3. There's a 0 somewhere in between there. The sign also flips again down here between 4 and 5. When x is 4, we're at a positive 3. 
When x is 5, we're at a negative 3. Remember that when the sign changes from positive to negative, it means the zero is somewhere in between those. So here is where we need to go ahead and adjust the window of our calculator. To do that, you go second button, and then the table set is the window button. So second window, and that's going to bring you to your table setup. Since I know my first zero is somewhere between negative two and negative one, I'm going to let my table start at negative two, and I want to switch it to counting by point ones. That triangle table is the counting pattern. Change that to point ones since we want our answer to be to the nearest tenth. Now you can go back to your table, and it will look like this. And we are once again looking for where that sign switches from positive to negative or negative to positive. And you can see that that happens right here when it switches from negative 0.36 to positive 0.25. We're looking for the value there that's the closest to zero. And the one which is the closest to zero is 0.25, which means that our approximate answer here would be x is about negative 1.5. Okay, we're gonna wanna do that exact same process to find the value of zero that's between four and five. I know my zero is somewhere there. So I'm going back to my table settings, second and then, so it's second, then window to get to the table settings. We know it's between four and five, so put your start at four and your count by point ones, and that will bring you to the table. Second graph gets you to that table, and now here we go. Okay, so I've got my table, let me zoom out a bit. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. So if I look at uh, my table, I'm looking for what's the closest to zero. And we can see how the zero is going to happen somewhere in between there, 0.25 and point, negative 0.36. When it switches signs from positive to negative, the zero has to be somewhere in the middle. We know that 0.25 is just a little bit closer, so our second solution would be x is about uh, four and a half. All right, now let's solve an equation by factoring. And this is going to go quicker because we don't need to use a calculator. Remember, when you solve by factoring, you do need to make sure that your equation is set equal to zero. And you want to keep your x squared term positive. So I don't want to move that x squared to the other side. It's hard to factor when x squared is a negative number. So instead, we're going to move things around. And let's move that x to join the x squared. We subtract x on both sides. And then we're also going to move this plus 72 to the opposite side by subtracting 72. And again, whatever I do on one side of my equal, I do on the other. So now I've got x squared minus x minus 72 equals 0. And now we're going to solve that by factoring. Since a is equal to 1, we can go ahead and use our x method and find two numbers that multiply to our c term of negative 72 while adding to our b term, which is negative 1. If you're not sure what numbers work, you can go ahead and list out your pairs of factors. 1 times 72, 2 times 36, 3 times 24, 4 goes into 72, 18 times, 5 doesn't, 6 times 12, or um, 8 times 9. All right, the ones that are going to help us here are the ones that are 1 apart, because we need a negative 1, so I'm going to use the 8 and the 9. To make a sum of negative 1, we need more negatives than positives, so 8 and negative 9. Now those join our factor pairs. So remember, we always start with x times x when we do the x method. And then just put the numbers that we found right here in with our x. So I have an 8 that's positive, so I need a plus 8. And I have a 9 that's negative, minus 9. And now, use that zero product property, set each factor equal to 0, and solve for x. Either x plus 8 equals 0 or x minus 9 equals 0. Then we're just going to go ahead and solve for x in each. Negative 8 is our first answer. For our second answer, if we add 9 on each side, we get x equal 9. Here's another example to solve by factoring. Um, once again, make sure it's set equal to 0 before you start. So I'm going to subtract that 17x on both sides. Then we have a 10x squared minus 17x plus 3 equals 0. Since a is equal to 10 here, we can't use the x method. We need to use the box method. For the box method, remember you do a times c. My a is 10 and my c is 3, so I need 10 times 3, 
which is 30. And we need to find two numbers which multiply to 30 while adding to negative 17. You'd run through your factor pairs and you'd find that the two numbers you need are 2 and 15. To make a negative 17, we need two negatives. Negative 2 times negative 15 is positive 30 and it adds to a negative 17. So now we're ready to do our box. Make your box and remember that the first term, so the 10x squared, that goes in your first box. And the last term, the positive 3, goes in your last box. The other two boxes, which are empty, you're going to put the two numbers from your x. A negative 2, add an x to it, and a negative 15, also add an x to it. What we've just done is we've split that middle term, negative 17x, into negative 2x plus negative 15x. Now we can work our way backwards. In this first row, I want to find the greatest common factor between 10x squared and negative 2x. They share a 2 and an x in common. And then we just work our way backwards now. If that has to multiply to 10x squared, we need a 2x times a, a 5x. Oops, let's switch colors here. So 5x. This box would need to be to multiply to that negative 2x. I would need 2x times negative 1. And down here, if we're going to multiply to negative 15x, we need the 5x multiplied by a 3x. Or excuse me, just a 3. So now our factors are just the outsides of our box. So my left side of my box is the 2x plus 3. The right side of my box is 5x minus 1. Again, that's still set equal to 0. So once you've got it factored, then you just go ahead and set each factor equal to 0 and use that um, zero product property. So I'm going to move over here for that. 2x plus 3 equals 0. Solve for x. So subtract your 3. Divide by 2. And x equals negative 3 over 2. Please leave your answers as fractions, unless they can be simplified perfectly to an integer. Uh, for the second one, if we do 5x minus 1 equals 0, we could go ahead and add 1 to each side. That's 5x equal 1. And then divide by 5. Let me zoom out a little bit. Whoops. Uh, there we go. So if I divide by 5, Voila, there we go, x is equal to one-fifth. Now let's use factoring to help us graph a function. The directions say to factor the equation, find the x-intercepts, axis of symmetry, and the coordinates of the vertex. Use the x-intercept, axis of symmetry, and vertex to graph the function. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is factor our equation. Since a is 1, we can just go ahead and use our x method. Find the two numbers that multiply to 3 and add to 4. And those two numbers are going to be 1 and 3. They multiply to 3 and they add to 4. So in factored form, I would have x plus 1 times x plus 3. And if we're going to find the x-intercepts, the x-intercepts occur where y is equal to 0. So just replace that with a 0. And now we can use our zero product property, set each of our factors equal to 0. Then go ahead and just get the x by itself. And our first answer would be negative 1. And our second answer would be negative 3. So those are my x-intercepts. That's where my parabola is going to cross the x-axis. So I'm going to my graph paper, and I'm plotting my x-intercept at negative 1. And then my second x-intercept at negative 3. When you're listing your x-intercepts, please list them as ordered pairs. Negative 1, 0 is one x-intercept. And my second x-intercept is negative 3, 0. Now that we have the x-intercepts, we need to find the vertex. And the vertex always occurs halfway in between your two x-intercepts. So what you can do is you can just average your x-intercepts. So add them together, negative 1 plus negative 3, and then divide by 2. So I'm going to go ahead and add that. That's negative 4 divided by 2, which is negative 2. So our axis of symmetry is x equals negative 2 and... It makes sense, too, when you look at the graph. When I sketched in that x equals negative 2 line, it's right in the middle of my two x-intercepts. Now, to get the vertex, we already have the x-coordinate that matches our axis of symmetry at negative 2. Then just go back to your equation, y equal, and replace the x value with negative 2. So do negative 2 squared plus 4 times negative 2 plus 3. You can put that whole thing into your calculator and you end up getting y equals um, negative 1. 
So our vertex is at negative two, negative one. So right there, and now just using your vertex and your x-intercepts, those three points, just turn them into a U. Whoops, that did not turn out very good. Let's try that again. It's hard with this little stylus pen that I've got. Um, there we go. And now we have it graphed. All right, now let's move on to reviewing how to simplify radicals. To do this, there are two methods. One, you can make a factor tree, or two, you can find the largest perfect square that divides evenly into your radicand. That's the thing under the radical, so I have 40. I'm gonna do method two first. So if you forgot how to do this, you can always go back and look at your 9.3 notes. You have the steps written there. Uh, remember that we need to find the biggest perfect square that goes into 40. So I'm gonna just divide 40 by two, and that's 20, okay? Then I want to find, look at all the perfect squares that are less than 20. So I have 1, 4, 9, and 16. After 16 comes 25. That's too big. 25 can't go into 40. Check at the biggest one. Check, does 16 go into 40? Nope. Does 9 go into 40? 40 divided by 9? No, that's a decimal. Oh, but 4. 4 goes into 40. So 4 is my biggest perfect square. So I'm just going to rewrite the square root of 40 as 4 times 10. You want that perfect square to be the first thing that you write. Then you can go ahead and split it apart into two radicals. So radical 4 times radical 10. And then we have ourselves a perfect square right here. The square root of 4 is 2. So root 40 simplifies down to 2 root 10. This next problem I'm going to do with the factor tree method. And again, if you want to do method number 2, you're welcome to do that. Pick the method that makes most sense to you. I know that 63 is 7 times 9. Seven's a prime, but 9 is 3 times 3. So I've made my factor pairs when I'm down to all primes. 7 is prime, 3 is prime, and 3 is prime. Then what you want to do is circle your pairs, and anything that can't be paired up, you put a box around it. Then take one number per pair out of your root. So 3 goes out because, remember, we're square rooting. Square root of 3 times 3 is equal to 3. And what can't be rooted, or uh, what can't be paired, excuse me, the 7, that goes under my radical. And 3 radical 7 would be the simplest form there. So now that we've reviewed how to simplify radicals, let's look at how to solve equations by taking square roots. When you're solving an equation with a square root, your goal is to get the x squared by itself. Once we have x squared by itself, we can undo the squared by taking a square root of each side. So for this particular problem, to get rid of that negative 4, we need to divide both sides of our equation by negative 4. That gets us down to x squared equals 9. Then we're ready to undo the radical. So to undo my radical, I'm going to take a square, or undo the squared, excuse me. To undo the squared, we take a square root. Remember, though, when you take a square root, there's always two answers. So don't forget that plus or minus symbol in front of your radical. So there's my plus or minus symbol. And root 9 is a perfect square, that's 3. So x is equal to plus or minus 3. Here's another example solving using square roots. And this time, again, I want to get my x squared by itself. That's always my first step. So I'm going to go ahead and subtract the 10 from both sides. And that'll get us down to 3x squared equals 180. Now, divide both sides by 3 to get x squared completely by itself, and that's x squared equals 60. Now that we have our squared part by itself, we're ready to take a square root of both sides. Don't forget the plus or minus in front. Now, 60 is not a perfect square, so you can reduce 60 by either doing method 1 or method 2. I'm going to go ahead and make a factor tree for 60. I know 60 is 6 times 10, and I'm going to keep breaking that down until I'm down to primes. 10 is 2 times 5, 6 is 2 times 3. Looking for pairs, we do have a pair of 2s, and we also have the 3 and the 5, which can't be paired, so they get boxed. Then outside, we take one number per pair, so 1, 2. And then anything which is boxed stays under the radical, so we have a 3 and we have a 5, and those are multiplied together to make 2 or at 15. So our final answer in simplest radical form would be x equals plus or minus 2 radical 15. 
In this final example, we are going to look at an application of solving using square roots, and that's modeling dropped objects. This is the last thing that you took notes on in lesson 9.4. So I have a cliff diver who's diving off a cliff 100 feet above the water, and we want to know how long is the diver in the air. In other words, how long does it take the diver to hit the water? So the first step is writing the equation, and we have that equation right here, the height at time t is equal to negative 16 t squared plus h sub zero. Now h sub zero is just the initial height. So since the professional cliff diver is 100 feet above the water, h sub zero is 100. Now for hitting the water, we know that the height of the water is equal to zero. So we're gonna be solving the equation, negative 16 x squared plus 100, set that equal to zero, and now we can solve it with square roots. So I'm gonna subtract 100 from each side, to get negative 16 t squared equals negative 100. Then divide both sides by negative 16 and we get t squared equals, and that gets, let's see, in my calculator I'm getting 6.25. Now we want the time, not time squared, so to undo the squared I'm taking a square root of both sides. Normally we would need the plus or minus in front of here, but for time, we want you to round it to the nearest hundredth, and it wouldn't make sense for me to have a negative time. So it's just going to be what comes out of my calculator. Square root of 6.25 is 2.5. Okay, that is an exact answer. So as far as rounding to the hundredths go, I don't need to round there. 2.5 is good. And then add the unit back in. So 2.5 seconds. So this cliff diver would be in the air for two and a half seconds. Then they'd hit the water. All right, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. Good luck as you try some review problems. See you in the next one. Bye.